Hello guys, welcome to the second video presentation in which we're going to review how to interpret the coefficients and we're going to review the concept of hypothesis testing, omitted variables and some measurements of goodness of fit. Okay guys, let's review the general notation of the model. We have in general uh, yi equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1 plus beta 2 times x2 and then we can add also other explanatory variables till we have beta k times xk and an error term. Therefore, the model has in general xk independent variable or explanatory variables, an error term ui, beta k slope coefficients, and one intercept which we call beta zero. At this level, there are still parameters for the model. And then we have an index i that is mapping each individual or observation in the sample till we have n, which is exactly the, the sample size. After we estimated OLS, we produce estimates for these parameters. And then we have usually this hat over the betas and also the hat over the use. And that means there are estimates of the parameters at the level of the population. There are several ways in which we can write our conclusions about the estimates of beta, but in general, the effect of xk on y is given by beta k, while holding all the other regressors that are included in the estimation constant. Because the estimates of beta are coefficients in a linear system of equations, we can directly interpret these estimates of beta k as slopes, that is, the rate of change in y related to what unit of change in xk. From the solution of OLS from calculus, we can directly interpret the beta coefficients as marginal changes, that is, the marginal effect on y for one unit of increase of xk. Similarly, we can also say that the estimates of beta k are partial effects of y for one unit of increase in xk. Finally, from conditional expectations, we can formulate a statement as following. The expected value of y given one unit of change in xk is beta k. For any categorical variable that has two or more categories, including binary variables, the effect of a given category is given by the difference in expectations between that category and all the other categories in the variable. This is an example. Suppose that we have a model that is explaining income with region. Region is a binary variable that takes the value of one when a person is living in an urban area or a value of zero if a person is living in a rural area then we can interpret beta 1 as the difference in mean income for an individual living in an urban area. As for the intercept, we can also interpret the intercept using the concept of conditional expectations. And in this case, the intercept is the expected value of y when all the other explanatory variables take a value of zero. The intercept will not all the time will have an economic meaning, but all the time will have a mathematical meaning as a value that the model needs to produce to estimate the beta k coefficients. In order to determine if the intercept has a meaning or an economic meaning, we need to take into account the theory behind, but also the intuition. If a model is predicting weight and one of the determinants of weight is your height, the intercept will not have a meaning if actually there is a person that has zero centimeters high. Another example could be if we have an equation predicting income and we have a control variable that is h, the model and the intercept in this case will not have a meaning if there is a person that has zero h. Okay, to follow with the interpretation of the binary binary interactions, let's take an example. We have the following model and we have estimates from OLS in which we have 17.67 for the intercept, 
13.38 for an urban, minus 5.76 for a female, and we have an interaction which is 3.55 for an urban and a female. We can then formulate the following statement. The expected value of y, or income in this case, for a female living in an urban area is just 17 plus 13.38 minus 5.76 minus 3.55 times 1 because 1 will take the value of 1 if there is a person living in an urban area and 1 because the female variable will take the value of 1 for a female. This is another example in which we can formulate a statement. The expected difference of income for a male living in an urban area is given by 17.67, which is the value of the intercept, plus 13.38, because the male is living in an urban area. And the other terms will be canceled out, given that female will take a value of zero, when we are talking about a male. For the interpretation of continuous and continuous interactions, let's take the following example. We have an equation in which we are predicting income by an intercept, education, and an interaction between education and experience. Then we can reformulate the model in terms of education by taking the coefficient of education, which is 1.42, plus the coefficient of the interaction, which is 0 0.051 times experience. And then these two terms are jointly multiplied by education, which is a common term. Then we can formulate the following statement. The expected effect of an additional year of education on income for an individual with one year of experience is given by the following expression. Another example is the following. For an individual with an average experience of 15 years, the estimated effect of one unit increase in education to income is 1.42 plus 0 0.51 times 15 times 1, which is approximate $2.19 dollars per hour. To analyze continued binary interactions, it's useful to firstly understand the kind of model that we are running. For instance, for this model, we have the variable wages that is predicted by beta zero, an intercept, beta one, a coefficient for education, beta two, a coefficient for a binary variable that is a female, beta three, that is an interaction between a continuous variable, education, that is measured in numbers of years, and a binary variable that is female, that takes the value of one if we have a female and a value of zero if we have a male. To analyze the model, first we need to evaluate the expectation of wage given that we have a female, and that is when we have the intercept beta zero plus the coefficient of a female plus the coefficient of beta 1 times education, plus the coefficient of beta 3, which is given by the interaction between education and female. In this first case, the coefficient of beta 2 will be multiplied by 1, and the coefficient of beta 3 will be multiplied times 1. For the second case, we analyze the expectation of wage, given we, that we have a, a male, and that is when we have beta 0 plus beta 2 times 0 and a second term that is beta 1 plus beta 3 times 0. Okay, if we simplify this expression, we can see that the difference in the two, the difference in the two models is given because we have two different intercepts, that is, the intercept for the case in which we have a female is beta 0 plus beta 2, but the expectation of wage when we have a male is only beta 0. Similarly, the coefficient for education in the first case 
when we have a female is given by beta 1 plus beta 3 whereas in the second case it's only given by beta 1 we can then conclude that actually this model is a model that can be evaluated with two different intercepts and two different slope coefficients for education okay moving into a second case in which we have an equation for which we have an intercept a continuous variable of education and a binary variable for a female we can perform a similar assessment for both cases in which we have wage given that we have a female and the expected value of wage again given that we have a male what we can observe is that the coefficient of beta 1 is the only coefficient affecting education however the intercept is different depending if we are analyzing the first case or the second case for which we can conclude that this model can be evaluated with two different intercepts but a same slope for education okay the last case for continuous and binary interactions is when we have a model similar to this one so again we have wage that is predicted by an intercept beta 0 and a continuous variable education beta 1 and an interaction between a continuous variable and a binary variable when we analyze the first conditional expectation of wage given that we have a female we can observe that the value of the intercept is only given by beta 0 and the value of education is given by the coefficients beta 1 and beta 3 as for the second conditional expectation when we have wage given that we have a male we can see that the coefficient of beta 0 is the one describing the intercept and the coefficient of beta 1 is the one affecting education therefore if we compare the two expressions we can conclude that this model can be evaluated with the same intercept but two different slope coefficients for education okay this is an example of an interpretation of a model that has an interaction of a binary and a continuous variable we have the following model we run OLS and we find that the predicted value of wage is given by an intercept of 2 plus 0 0.89 for every year of education minus 0.55 for the interaction between years of education and a binary variable that is a female to analyze the effect of an additional year of education on wage which we suppose that is the variable of interest in this model we can just group the estimate of education which is 0 0.89 minus the estimate of the coefficient for the interaction between education and female which is 0 0.55 and then we can group these two terms both multiply times the variable of education then we can just state an argument similar to the following for females the expected value of income for each additional year of education is 2.34 dollars per hour okay we can evaluate some elements of hypothesis testing first we know that if the sample is random then the sampling distribution of the OLS estimators follows a normal distribution centered in the parameter of the population beta k with a constant variance then given that we are using a sample to approximate the distribution of these population parameters we use a t-student distribution to approximate the normal distribution then we define the estimate of the standard deviation of the OLS beta k estimators as the standard error knowing the standard error we can then define a confidence level that is associated with a critical value for instance a confidence level of 95 percent is associated with a critical value of 1.96 the value of 1.96 is only for the cases in which we have a sample size that has 100 or more observations with the standard error and the critical value we can formulate a confidence interval which has 
an upper and a lower threshold. On the lower threshold, we have the estimate of beta k that we get from OLS minus t, the t value associated of this for this confidence level, which in this case is 1.96, multiplied by the standard error of beta k. For the upper threshold, we have the estimate of beta k plus the critical value of t associated with this confidence level of 95%, which is 1.96, times the standard error of beta k. Given a random sample from the population, the confidence interval is the range of values from which we expect to find the true population parameter. The standard error, however, is an indicator of the spread of the sampling distribution of the beta coefficients. After we have computed OLS and we have produced estimates for the beta k coefficients, we can then proceed to analyze the effect of xk, certain explanatory variable, on the dependent variable y. Depending on the underlying question that we want to give an answer to, for instance, if x has a statistically significant effect on y, we can formulate a two-sided hypothesis test. This two-sided test contains two competing statements about the sampling distribution of the beta k coefficient. Under the null hypothesis, the sampling distribution of the beta k coefficient is centered in zero. Alternatively, the beta k coefficient is not centered in zero. We can formulate corresponding null and alternative hypotheses for the case in which we want to assess if x has a positive effect on y or if x has a negative effect on y. What is important to notice is under the null, the sampling distribution of the beta k coefficient is equal to zero for all the cases. And if we fail to reject this null hypothesis, the implication of that is that there is no statistical, statistically significant effect of x on y. After we have stated the null and the alternative hypothesis, we also need to formulate a significance level and a confidence level. The significance level and a confidence level correspond to probabilities in the sampling distribution of the beta k coefficients. For a two-sided test with a significance level of 0.05, the corresponding critical value will be 1.96 on the right side of the distribution and minus 1.96 to the left side of the distribution. The last step is to calculate a t-value or t-score for the estimate of beta k from OLS. And under the null, h0, beta k is centered in zero. Because the formulation of the hypothesis is around two competing statements, rejecting the null hypothesis is finding evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Conversely, failing to reject the null hypothesis implies finding evidence against the alternative hypothesis. Statistically, failing to reject H0 means that the sampling distribution of the beta k coefficients is centered in zero. Hence, there is no effect of x on y. We can reject the null hypothesis is that if the absolute value of the t-score associated with beta k is greater than the absolute value of a critical value. Alternatively, we can also reject h0 if the p-value is smaller than the corresponding significance level. There are some cases in which we are interested in analyzing the joint hypothesis for two or more beta k coefficients. This joint distribution of two or more beta k coefficients is no longer described by a normal distribution, but by an f distribution. Under the new, 
a set of beta k coefficients is equal to zero. And the alternative hypothesis is that at least one of these variables is different than zero. The f-test also has a significance level and a confidence level. We can then reject the null hypothesis if the corresponding f-statistic is greater than some f-critical value. Alternatively, we can also look at the p-value and compare it to the corresponding significance level. And then we will reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is smaller than 0.05 for a confidence level of 95%. One application of the joint hypothesis for two or more beta k coefficients is when we are comparing what we call the restricted and the unrestricted model. If the outcome of certain population process is well described by a model, then each variable inside of this model can be seen as a restriction of certain population process. The motivation for this comparison is because that we know that as we increase the number of variables inside of a model, also the goodness of fit will be better. But that doesn't necessarily will imply that we have a good model. In generally, we seek for parsimonious models, that is, simpler models that explain certain population process. We can then proceed to define a restricted model and an unrestricted model. The restricted model contains a group of variables that is inside of the unrestricted model. That is, the number of variables in the restricted model is always less than the unrestricted model. Therefore, the restricted model is a simpler version of the model. Then, with the sum of the square residuals for the restricted model and the unrestricted model, taking into consideration the number of restrictions q, the number of variables in the unrestricted model k, and the sample size, we can compute this f statistic that is also computed in STATA. Then, rejecting a0 supports the inclusion of q variables or restrictions in the unrestricted model. Okay guys, from the definition of Stock and Watson of bias, we can read that the bias is the difference between the estimate of beta and the true population parameter. The first important thing to notice about this definition is that if there's no correlation between xk and u, which is the error, then we do not have a bias. If the correlation is different than zero, then we will have a consistent problem even if the sample is large. To illustrate this concept, let's give the following example. Let's assume that we run a regression on wage that is explained by an intercept, a coefficient of education, and an error term. However, the true population process that explain wage needs to take into account not only the years of education, but also the experience that you have in the labor market. Then actually the model that represents the true population process will be the model two that contains wage, an intercept, a coefficient for education, a coefficient from experience, and an error term. Then if you are unaware of this problem, we will produce estimates of education from model one, and then our error term in this model will contain the effect of experience and a random component of the error term that we should expect that on average will tend to go to zero. Then we can have the following cases. If there's no correlation between education and experience, then that implies that the correlation between education and the error terms in model one will be zero. Then the estimate of beta one of education is unbiased. The second case is when experience has a positive relationship with wage, and that implies that there is a positive correlation between wage and experience. And then the coefficient of beta two of experience will enter into the equation of the error terms in model one with a negative sign. Then if there's a positive correlation between education and experience, 
That implies that the correlation between education and the error terms in Model 1 is negative. That is because experience is contained as a negative term. Finally, we can conclude that our estimate of beta 1 for education has an upward bias. The case number 3 is when experience has a negative relationship on wage, and that implies that the correlation between wage and experience is negative. Therefore, the coefficient of beta 2 of experience will enter into the equation of the error terms in model 1 as a positive sign. Then, if there is a positive correlation between education and experience, that implies that the correlation between education and the error term in model 1 will remain the same. Hence, we can conclude that our estimates will have a downward bias. We can perform a similar analysis for the other two cases.